Production of this program has been made possible in part by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Southern Educational Communications Association and in part by the Friends of LPB. Baton Rouge blues is really the single most significant form of music that the city has produced. And it's a form of music that people haven't recognized heretofore. But it is the form by which Baton Rouge will be known outside the state, outside this country. It's regionally significant and it's part of the city's tradition. Because I don't care who you listen to now, there's a blues note in there somewhere. And people can tell you what they want, but everyday life is blues. Musicians thought of the river as the street, the way to move, you know, and as much as Highway 61, which also goes out of Baton Rouge and is the, the legendary blues highway. It's mentioned in all the songs, and it, it was the route north to Chicago for Louisiana and the Mississippi Delta people and everywhere. So the river, the river is definitely affected by the blues in Baton Rouge by both bringing music sounds in, carrying music and musicians out. Sit up all night one night, a fella. When he went on the river and come back and brought him back a new song. But he had hear it down there on the river, you know. And he come back down. I sit up all night trying to play that song. But well, whenever I hear him play, I wouldn't have it right, like I want. 
I kept on having that name until I finally got it. He said, name, you got it now. I said, yeah, I got it. Stella guitar, and I kept that guitar and went out. And he got him a new one. And I kept that guitar and I kept it back. And I break a string. I didn't hate no, I didn't hate now nothing to put on there. I got me a piece of hay copper wire and tied it and put me a pencil across down there and kept on playing. It'd make a poor man wonder, but he ain't got no place to go. You know my house done fell down And I can't go home no more I got to find some good woman That gonna love me and treat me right I got to find some good woman That gonna love me and treat me right I said a woman I used to love, what happened? That do nothing but fuss and fight. Might as always well, love it. Mm. It'd been other fast stuff all when I was coming up, but I never did. Nothing like that didn't never move me when I had the blues on the thing what put my mind around me, you know, they get to thinking about somebody. Well I see what I say, what I think, what it had how it hit me. It was a lady. The lady I wanted to see. Well that's 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 where them blues hit me. That's what it is. That's all what it is. Well, it's all over, baby. Child, I believe I got to move. Oh, it's all over, baby. Child, I believe I got to move. I said, when you see me worrying, you know you are hating me. When you're talking about the older blues man, I mean, you're talking about, a, you know, a, a kind of a, a shimmering, slipping away, I think, American national resource, a cultural resource, if you want to look at it like that. I mean, they're like, to me, they're like the redwood trees. I mean, they're people, and that's the most important thing to remember. But they should be thought of all Americans, by all Americans, as being as important as the Grand Canyon and redwood trees and things like that, because even though they're not a you know a immutable sort of uh, you know object, they're they're people. They're carrying traditions and and making expression that are so much a part of American life that when they go, you have to really think about that a lot. It is a seventy years, well, almost almost seventy. Yeah, I've been here a long time, and and I, I about know the I about know the blues now, cause see my daddy was a blues. Them, his four brothers, they would play it, piano. One was playing piano and accordion. He could eat them things up. Now if you got a little woman, started running around, you better find you somebody. She's going to put you down, let her go. Man, just as quick as you can. Oh, 
about that little woman. She ain't gonna hoodoo the hoodoo man. She took all my money, spent it all over town. When I got rid of my love, my woman couldn't be found after all. I did all in that world I can. Because that little woman, she done who do the who do man. She got me. Well, my daddy was a guitar player, and I started playing when I was big enough to pick a guitar. Started to pick about, about seven, eight years old when I started, because he was playing guitar. And I found a guitar, and I got big enough notes in the house. I just pick his guitar and go rap mornings until I got lunch. And further up there, I got even I got more old guitar, second-hand guitar for a dollar and a half. That's all I paid for back then. Can't understand how she made it to love me. She got another man after all. I did all in that world I can. He called that little woman. She done who do the who do man. And I started playing the blues, and I was about to. I must have been about 15 years old then. So when I started playing, and I got about, uh, say, it's about 17 years old, I started. Mom and I didn't want me to go out, but I, I went out. We didn't let me go sometime with some old men who could play. And go and play in the most house seven way back yonder when they gave them a house party. And he used to go and play, and I'd grab them on the guitar in, and I had them. Then the little jazz horn you put in your mouth with a cigarette paper, you might know what I'm talking about. And I just picked it up from way back yonder. That's all I've been playing. Man, I can play a little other stuff, but I don't fool with it. Yeah. I just play what I, what I learned way back then and stay with it. Silas Hogan, to me, is the grandfather figure in Baton Rouge blues today. Uh, not just because of his uh, Buddha-like appearance and his salt and pepper gray hair and his kind demeanor to everybody, uh, but because his style is the basic old-time style. He plays these incredible drawn-out one-string leads with droning effect on the other strings. He makes up his own songs about his experiences and his family experiences, about hard work and traveling. He's got a song called Rats and Roaches uh, that is just, uh, you know, like a stark kind of blues existential comment on life in, in a house where things aren't quite right, you know. Oh, well, I was sitting right there on, let's see, not, not in that room. With that back door at, right there, that was my, my kitchen was then. And I was sitting up there, just like this, I was practicing. And a big rat run over my feet. Rat, that's right. Now you run over there. You know, run over there. And I'm saying a couple of roaches. And you know, like this. And most anybody got a rat, so if you don't watch yourself, you got them. And I seen a couple of roaches run on over the cabinet, run up across the cabinet. Room. I said, Shit, I'm on. And I started picking the guitar and writing it. I hollered, I got a, I got a roach in my kitchen, mouse is like a drove of coon. Sink like these rats and roaches gonna drive me out of my room.
he and Guitar Kelly are just, you know, old time pals. It's kind of like Lead Belly and Blind Lemon Jefferson, a la Baton Rouge. They hang together, they play together, and they're just really dedicated to playing the blues together. And uh, you can't help but be real moved by seeing them together. Red running in Marquette. Road to the round Marquette. Red running in Marquette. Road to the round Marquette. The red got so brave. They shut the gas up on my stove. I don't believe, I don't believe the blues won't die. Blues, blues were here when nothing else wasn't here. And I think it's gonna be here when everything else is gone. It'll be wretched. I was supposed to be going to school. I was cutting class. Going up to a lady's house, her name was White. She had a piano, and she could play the blues. And that's what I wanted to do. And that's what I did. What about the blues? Blues follows me all day long. I got a few spankings about it, but I still played the blues. When I got up to uh, big enough to, you know, to make a little money at it, and my, and my daddy, uh, my, that's my son. <laughs> special case in the Baton Rouge blues because uh, he grew up around Baton Rouge. He's from the little community of Alson. Uh, he was born in New Orleans, but he spent, uh, oh, I think about 15 years in Chicago and uh, played with Howlin' Wolf and Sunnyland Slim and a lot of the major uh, Chicago bluesmen who themselves had migrated out of the South and gone to the city. And uh, unlike a lot of the men who stayed up there, uh, he came home. I get to Louisiana, I, I did get a job. I was with East Baton Rouge Parish School Board. But uh, I'm a roofer. So I worked there 14 years, but I was playing music at, at the same time. Well, 
up in Chicago, I played them. See now, it's one called Morris P. Joe, Dusty Brown, and uh, Earl Phillips. And then from that, I think uh, well, we had a trio called the Red Devils Trio. Played with them. And then from that, I think it was uh, Jimmy Rogers and Jimmy Reed, Muddy Water, Lil Walter, Howlin' Wolf. Just, just own up, you know. Henry Gray, because of his Chicago influences and playing ensemble with big bands like Howlin' Wolf and, and uh, Sonny Land Slim, has a very smooth, polished kind of sound, an ensemble playing sound. But the great thing about Henry to me is that he's never forgotten his ability and the importance of just playing alone. refers to playing alone as being naked. You know, when you're playing rhythm, lead, bass, melody, all at once, he refers to that, you know, just a man and his piano, that's naked on stage. And you really gotta be a great musician to carry that. It's soul, it's all it. It, it, it's soul. It's soul with a feeling. When you get that feeling, you, you got the blues, really. He is really one of two major figures that have left Baton Rouge. He's one of the older figures. Uh, Buddy Guy has never returned to Baton Rouge. Buddy Guy is a, a younger guitar player who's pretty well known uh, nationally in the blues circuit. Uh, Henry Gray is pretty well known as a piano player. He's come back. Maybe one day Buddy Guy will come back to Baton Rouge. I've heard he's thought of opening a club here. He's heard about the blues having a kind of a renaissance, so uh, maybe we'll get him back one day. September 25th, 1957, 8.40 a.m. in the morning. Never forget that. That's when I left the city of Baton Rouge. So I just left and went and caught the train, so I'm gone, you know. My mother say, I want you to, you know, you're a man, go, you know. And uh, if you're having a problem, call me back and come back home, you know. And uh, I thought about it, <laughs> but uh, I had to prove to myself that uh, I was going to do something and be from that mood. Have you ever been mistreated? <laughs> well, then you know just what? I'm talking about. Listen. Lord, I sing it out loud. Have you ever been mistreated? Better. You know, you know just what, Lord, what I'm talking about. Yeah. Lord, I worked five long years for one woman. And she had to. To put me out. Lord, I got a job at a steel mill. Truck is still 
you just like a slave. <laughs> Five long years of a Friday woman, I went straight home with a long I just always was a, a string lover. You know, I, my mother used to, to spank me for taking all the screen off her windows tied down there trying to make a guitar, you know, because I would strip the screen apart and make a guitar string out of it. So finally my dad gave a, a guy a couple of dollars for a guitar had one string on it. And I just banged that for, oh gee, I don't know how long. But anyway, I was sitting on my sister's porch in, in Baton Rouge and a guy walked by and he says, oh. He said, son, I bet if you had a guitar, you would learn how to play. I said, I sure would. He said, be sitting here tomorrow. And I was. And he came by and, and take me downtown and bought me a guitar with the strings on. Buddy Guy, in a sense, was a gift from Baton Rouge to the world, in the sense that his trip to Chicago, out of the South, out of Baton Rouge to Chicago, uh, sprung him loose for a larger audience. Uh, made it better, made him better able to innovate. But Baton Rouge is the one that I got a chance to meet there. The, uh, as I said, Lightning, the Slim Hoppo, the uh, Laser Lesters, the, uh, and see the BB Kings and the, Joe Turner's and whoever else they would bring to the temple. And it's right on uh, North Boulevard and 13th Street. And uh, the only time I would get a chance to see a professional was there. And I wouldn't miss that for nothing in the world. And they would come every Monday night. And I was trying to go to school then and work too. And you can imagine how I was feeling on a Tuesday morning. They call the stormy Monday. The say is just as bad. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I said, come, come, it's so me, Monday morning. Oh, 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 is all wrong, wrong, so sad. You know, you couldn't find guitar players on every corner like you do now. You know, uh, people are, uh, it wasn't as many as it is now, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, people weren't making big money. You, you couldn't look up and see, uh, uh, let's say, a prince making all this money to influence another young kid to say, gee, I better learn how to play a guitar or something like that. So maybe, maybe I, if I do, I could do as well, you know. Uh, so in my days, you just had to love the music yourself from inside to really wants to play that thing because there wasn't no future in it. You know, you just was a, a guitar player, you know. And nowadays the kids can say, get me a guitar, which my son said, get her up and get me a guitar. I want, <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta do something myself, because they see. Now that's why I'm hanging on to this place. Uh, I don't know if I told you, but I don't go to the bank with this place. I just love it enough to have somewhere so, where somebody can see this and know it still exists. Welcome to the Check It Bowl, ladies and gentlemen. One time Especially now, we lost, uh, in the last five or six years, we lost a lot of great black blues musicians. We lost Jimmy Reed, Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Water, J.B. Hutto, Lightning Hopkins, all those people in a period of six, seven years, I would say. And uh, 
Sometimes it scares you, you know, you look around and say, gee, who, who am I going to listen to now coming out with new records? And some people come up to me now and say, you and Junior was the last, the last, the last two left, you know. So I said, well, okay. I spoke to Muddy about two, three months before he passed. And I said, how you doing? He said, I'm doing all right. Just keep the blues alive for me. And I said, okay, I promise. <laughs> I'm a local blues singer. Well, they got a local blues singer in every town you go in. They got one in every little small town. They got a blues singer somewhere. See, I sing the way I feel, you know? And I, I'm not singing commercially like some guy want to sing nice and go on and sell a record. I'm not trying to sell a record. I'm trying to sing the way, sing my feelings. And I figure if I sing my feelings, somebody out there is going to dig what I feel. time you see me, things won't be this way. Next time you see me, things won't be this way. Well, you know, pretty baby, only got yourself to blame. Tabby Thomas almost single-handedly is responsible for bringing back the blues to Baton Rouge. There's just no doubt about that. Uh, he's a musician, guitar player, he started with piano, he's a club owner, and maybe mo most important of all, he's a father. He's got two sons that he's brought up who play music. Chris plays uh, guitar, and Tammy plays drums. I think the young blacks now, they're beginning to realize that that's their heritage and that's their culture. Plus, I'm playing guitar, but a guy, a lot of guys, we playing a type of sound on the guitar that they really dig. You see, it's not a low-down blues, you know, doom, 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 something simple. We off into some high-energy type. Without Tabby, I don't think the Baton Rouge blues scene would have come back the way you've seen it come back. He's given people a place to play. And, you know, when he writes on the wall in the black uh, paint, home of the Baton Rouge blues man, he's right. It really is. We also got Cadillac in the house. He's a fine hop player, plays with the circuit breakers. And he's a hell of a man. So we're going to have a time out here tonight. We got Silas Hogan. We got Wishman Smith coming up here after I get out. He's coming up here. So uh, we're going to have a good time out here tonight. Gypsy woman told my mother, before I was born, got a boy child coming. Going to be a son of a gun. See the blues box, it amplifies really what the social structure of the United States of America, what way it should be. Because when you come into blues box, Everybody there, you just yourself. You have it white, black, whoever you are. People don't care if you're a Chinaman. They don't care. You know, they just everybody's there to have a good time listening at the blues. Well, I'm the hoochie coochie man. When I open up the blues box, I just hold my say it's gonna be the blues or nothing. There wasn't no rock and roll, just blues. Blues box is kind of a, it's kind of an oasis. It's a place where an old musician that's been playing his whole life, taught by by his grandfather or, or his uncles or whatever, uh, gets a chance to meet these young people who are listening or into the blues. Uh, it's one of the only places around here uh, that these people can interact. All right, Kelly. Tell me, baby, I want your love and He makes them.
make sure the old men are taken care of. He's not a he's not on a big ego trip about uh, playing. Uh, he wants to give Silas Hogan and Guitar Kelly and all those guys a forum, and that's a really rare quality in a club owner and a musician to be able to be so open to all those types of music. And I mean, single-handedly, he's helped conserve a whole cultural style in, in the area. We're gonna send this out to Silas Hogan, lovely lady, and also to Whispering Smith, lovely lady. Also to Mr. Woodfog, lovely lady. The other night I was at the club, and uh, it had been about a couple of weeks ago, and Silas Hogan was singing the blues. I don't know, Silas must have been feeling really good that night, because I he, I wasn't even thinking about what he was singing. I was waiting behind the bar, and every night he'd hear him say something, and I kept listening. And he was singing about, I think he was talking about a backdoor man, some kind of blues by the backdoor man. So I, I called my house, I get the call back home, <laughs> see. I called my wife, I said, hey, babe, what you doing? She said, I ain't doing nothing. I said, I just called you to see how you was doing, <laughs> you know. Ain't that love you, babe? Ain't that love you, babe? A lot of times, the guy will sing a song, and he'll put something on your mind and make you start thinking. And this is basically what the blues is all about, if you listen to the lyrics. Through the start recording. A lot of times you go in the studio, it was a two-track machine. You know, you had to sing on one track and the whole band be playing on the other track. Some of the guys was out of key. They didn't have tuning equipment like you got now. Bring it up just a little more, son. Back there in 1946, when I set my studio up, there was very little to do, to setting up for a recording studio. If I recall correctly, and I believe I do, I had three microphones. I had a, a little four-channel Ampex mixer. I had a little audio amplifier and a mono recorder. And uh, it didn't take any time at all to set up there. Just turn, <laughs> turn the current on. We were in business. I met Jay Miller back in 1954. I came from California, and I, I asked him, everybody around here where they had a record, record, record company, and they told me about Crowley. So I went to his house one Sunday morning, knocked on his door, and told him who I was. He said, well, look, come back by 1.30, and I'll see what I can do. I didn't get any money from Jay Miller on the records I made. But I got the opportunity to get out there and hustle. I think the role of a small record producer goes beyond the whole area of making money. I think uh, 
First of all, if someone's in the record business and is dealing with a special market, then generally they're doing it based on a commitment that goes beyond money because there is not a lot of money to be made in that area. J.D. Miller in Louisiana recorded many people who would not have been recorded by large record companies. And he got those records out to a limited market. And the market is tough, it's tough. Unfortunately, uh, local artists, and of course we're going back to blues artists, you, you, if you ever listen to radio, you, you know as well as I do, you seldom ever hear a good blues record, and that's a shame. So uh, consequently, very few people put out blues albums because the financial expenditure is such a gamble. You know, you can have the greatest album that was cut. If nobody hears it, you have nothing. Then I'm crawling through the grass, baby. When the grass is high, I'm gonna keep on crawling to you, baby. Till the day I die, I'm a crawling king's name. Well, and you know I rule my day. I think when all of us get together and unite and say, hey man, let's try to push this guy. We'll be a part of something. We done helped the guy get somewhere, you know? And it, it gives you that feeling, you know? You might not be the star, but you can help a person be something. You know, and this is all I'm trying to do with my life, the rest of my life, you know, I want to try to help somebody. I didn't make it, and I ain't thinking about making it. I'd like to see somebody else make it, you know? Now I was going to do candy, but my son wanted me to do the hoodoo party, so we're going to do the hoodoo party. Well, the hoodoo king, the hoodoo queen, gave a little party down in New Orleans. Heard a woman scream, turn around. I have to be patient, you know, saying I'm a blues singer or whatever like that, because these guys like Henry Gray and Silas, they've been around all their life singing it, you know, and, and they just not getting the recognition they deserve here at home. I'm, I'm just being patient. My time's going to come for me. They count it stormy Monday, baby. Long of Tuesday is just as bad. All of us got kids coming and out there playing now, you know. Plus, we got an uh, intermatch with a lot of young, good white blues players playing, you know, that's energetic, that's trying to get out of here. Well, Thursday is also I just got c taken up by the genuineness and, and the beauty of, of the music, and uh, I guess couldn't, could never let go of it. Uh, the more that I get into it and play it, the more I like it. The night before the 84 Blues Festival, B.B. came in the club and, you know, he began playing with the band then. But he had been to some jam sessions there. And his tone and everything like that, you know, Moe's had passed uh, about a month before that. And, you know, it's like, you know, nobody's gonna come along with that sound, you know, or that feel that Moe's had. But if anybody around the area have the potential to, you know, feel one of Moe's shoes, maybe, <laughs> it's B.B with his heart playing. His regular harmonica player, Moses Smith, was sick in the hospital. And so Tabby called me up and asked me if I would play at the Blues Festival. So I said, fine. That was the day before. So I went and started practicing. And, and uh, I heard about the same time we were on stage is when Moses passed on. And uh, I didn't know that. but. Uh, there was, some, there was something that hit me then. <laughs> there was a, a certain kind of spirit on that stage that I haven't felt since or before. Nothing down in Texas, baby. All the telephone lines down.
losing Whisper and Smith as a musician and as a person, uh, it's hard to calculate how important that is in Baton Rouge blues now. Just at, at a time where all these young people are taking up the music, um, it's very important to have some of the old masters on each instrument around to, to pass it on. Dark out of Whispering Smith uh, was a great singer and a great harmonica player, and he's really going to be missed. We're lucky he recorded a few things before he went, and that will give some of the young musicians uh, a legacy to look to, to listen to, to follow in his footsteps with. But uh, his loss is, is incalculable. A lot of people think the blues is, uh, is something that you sing when you're sad to make you sadder. But I think the blues originally, and in its best, is a release for, from sadness or the trials of life or the uh, just everyday living. The audience can relate to the, the singer or the player, and together they go over this fact of life and then they release it. They just say, okay, that's the way it is. Let it go, you know. And they're, they're ready for, for more life. Is this a blues festival? Can I play some blues? Someone's on the phone It's three o'clock in the morning They're talking back I see you can make me right Yeah, we'll love you Ooh, when you really feel good about somebody Ain't nothing wrong in being in love with There's a resurgence and, and a, a, a renewed respect for the blues that is growing in the black community. And I think one example of that is the fact that uh, there are more and more large blues festivals that are developing in this region that are put on and developed by black people. Baby, love and Will you be good to me? I'll be good to you. As far as the blues festival, we started down there, me, Henry, and Silas, at the old state capital. And it used to be just about maybe 200 people. Last year, they had maybe, say, 15, 20,000. This year, it's going to be about 35 or 40,000. Well, that's the greatest thing that happened to a blues singer, to look out and see people like Sunday. I'm telling you, that's, that's one of the greatest things. That's the payoff of a lifetime. Just, if the money wasn't there, just the people, just to see the people out there and really enjoying it. They wasn't out there just standing and looking. They was enjoying it, clapping, dancing, and everything. I bought you a brand new phone. You say, Ray, I want a Cadillac. I let you live in my penthouse. And you call it an old shack. I bought you a $50 dinner. You say, thanks for the snack. I gave you seven children. Long you want to give them back. I've been down on it, baby. 
We've undergone a major revival of the blues, and we're lucky that we've got all these survivors who made it through the down times. In the 1960s, um, the blues really went into kind of a depression in one sense. Um, you know, it was a time of the civil rights movement. It was a time when people were looking to national bases of power. And uh, in the black community, the blues went way down because the blues were thought of as being, you know, related to Uncle Tomism and, and uh, going along rather and getting along rather than making real social change. Then the 70s saw a revival, and Tabby will tell you, and all the blues musicians at town will tell you that there was a major influence of young white musicians and whites interested in the music who had come up through rock and roll and who realized that the base of rock and roll had been blues. Make your body rock and roll. Mick Jagger's got to cross the ocean and go looking around to find something that's, you know, on North Street here. And some people are aware of that and think it's worth it. And some people don't, just don't even have any idea what kind of value we have here in the city. But it's, it's getting better. The Blues uh, Festival downtown has, has showed that, that there's a lot more appreciation now than there has been for years. Little bit boy with a heart of steel. But my sister sure will Feel good music I've been told It's good for your body And it's good for your soul And I'ma hear you say Hey, 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 hey Hey, pack your way Hey, hey, yeah Hey, pack your way Blues is not dead, you know Ain't gonna never die but it's going into a different form now. The blues is surviving. The blues is kind of like the bow weevil. You know, uh, you think he's gone, and the next thing you see, his whole family is there. The festival is going to help it a lot in the South. It's going to wake up a lot of people. You know, it's already doing it. But every year you have the festival getting thousands and thousands more coming out. And I think it's going to grow and grow and between 10 or 15 years, it's going to be a multi-million dollar project. Because New Orleans is known for jazz, Baton Rouge is known for the blues. festival and as they grow you know I'll grow with it I'm very serious about you know the blues and what I'm doing and uh, hopefully one day I can you know add my legacy to the you know have my name on the list you know with the other guys I just hope that I can take it and enhance it you know and maybe you know bring up another generation of it because all these guys are about 30 40 years older than I am but Hopefully I can take it and keep it going and be the future. Ladies and gentlemen, have you enjoyed the festival this year? Thank you so much. Buddy Stewart, one of the coordinators along with me, Mr. Richard Savino, executive director.
Production of this program has been made possible in part by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Southern Educational Communications Association and in part by the Friends of LPB.